All right, let's get started. Um, I guess I have a microphone now. So I'm going to talk about the image processing pipelines, um, as uh, was mentioned or alluded to several times before. We're going to start out with um, an overview, a really fast overview of the pipelines as we sort of have them planned out right now. This is going to be really, really high level, um, but hopefully sort of get you interested in the idea, um, maybe answer some large scale questions. Then we're going to do a little bit of a, a dive into the details of how we do detection, just one small piece of the overall pipeline, um, and you'll get a chance to brainstorm how to do some of the things that we haven't dreamed up exactly how we want to do them ourselves. Um, and we'll finish up with just to talk about different kinds of coads. Coads are one of the things that people like to talk about, and it's, they, it can be surprising if you haven't thought about them, what they actually mean. So here's an, a big top-level sketch of the overall processing for the yearly data release pipeline. We start out by processing one visit at a time. Um, we basically do a lot of calibration stuff, rough calibration stuff. Um, we do image differencing. This is how we find moving objects. We um, subtract two images from each other after matching them together in various ways. Um, we also take these measurements of bright objects and do a big self-calibration. Um, this is the sort of stuff um, uh, that uh, Chris Evans was talking about earlier with um, being able to determine the distortion by seeing all the different images that went into it and, and finding uh, a map that lines them all up. Um, we take those calibrations. We take the PSF models, the exposures. Um, and we combine all that into the deep processing. There's a whole lot in this little box right here. Um, we co-add images. We detect all the deep things. We merge in all the, the moving and transient things. Um, and we measure them. Um, and then we actually have to take these co-ads, and we have to use them to do the difference imaging. And you, as you can see, that creates a circular dependency, and we're not quite sure how we're going to solve that yet. Um, nightly, though, we do this much of the pipeline. We're probably going to do a version of it that runs faster um, and is perhaps less careful about some things that don't matter for these purposes. This is just to get alerts out to the rest of the community for interesting transients that, might, that people might want to follow up. We'll repeat all of this during the data release pipeline in a, probably a, a slower and more careful way, um, but we'll do all of this every night. In fact, we'll do all of this for every visit, um, as Steve just said, 60 seconds after it comes off the telescope. Michael. It's essentially at the beginning, and that's my next slide. So this is the visit processing. Thanks. He, he, he actually isn't a plant, even though he seems like it. Um, so this is maybe a little bit weird looking. This is one CCD. This is another CCD. And these are snaps. Snaps are what we in data management have started calling the two um, exposures that go into a visit. So Steve alert alluded to 30-second exposure times. That's actually expected to be split up into sort of two 15-second two exposures. Um, that will uh, essentially point to the same part of the sky, expose for 15 seconds, read out, same part of the sky, another 15 seconds, read out. And that will allow us to get rid of things like cosmic rays and maybe even use it to find some fast moving stuff. Question? Is there a dither? There's no dither between those 15 seconds. Um, in fact, we're hoping that we can just continue guiding and not have to do any warping to align the images up, but that remains to be seen whether that's possible. Um, so anyhow, we run the, what we call instrument signature removal. Um, we flat field, we debias, we do all the usual things that you do when you're modifying pixels to try to correct for instrumental effects. You can't correct all instrumental effects by modifying pixels, but the ones you can, you want to do that, and you do it up front. And that happens every, every CCD for every snap. At this stage, we actually combine the snaps. Um, and for every point after that, we process one CCD, but it includes both, both images. There's a possibility there'll be a difference of snaps that we might do some processing on right now, um, but that's not part of the baseline plan. Now, yeah, instrument signature removal. Yes, that's right above combined snaps. That's ISR. Um, so then we, we estimate the background, we, do, we detect all the sources, we deblend the sources, we measure all the sources, we do a fit for the, the coordinate system, the astrometric calibration, um, and this we do over the entire visit, all the CCDs at once. You can imagine, for instance, that you could have complete garbage in one CCD, 
and you, but you know where it is relative to the other ones because it's always in the same part of the camera. So the fact that you can get a solution for the neighboring ones means you can solve the one even though it's complete garbage. Now that isn't the only reason you'd want to fit all the CCDs at once for astrometry, um, but it's one of the reasons. Um, and likewise for the background, you want it to be smooth between chips to, after you've calibrated for the instrumental effects. Uh, certainly for PSF modeling, you want to do that over the whole visit. Um, and probably for photometric calibration and aperture corrections, just because we know how the camera, um, how the chips, uh, we know the relationship between the ship, chips should be essentially stable. And so once we've corrected for those things, all of these things should be smooth. Um, well, we'll still detect it on the edge, but because there's a gap between chips, it's very, uh, and the gap is, large enough compared to the size of objects that it, only very large objects will you, would you bother to try to connect that up. So at this stage, at least, we're not trying to, to treat those as one object. We'll just treat them as two separate objects and two separate chips and, worry, and probably throw them out of this level of analysis. Michael. Um, essentially because there are more parameters that go into the PSF model that are visit level parameters that need to be constrained from all the CCDs rather than um, sort of single chip parameters. A lot of these other things I think are sort of this background, for instance, is, is very local. You know, it's, you want it to be smooth across chip boundaries, but there isn't maybe some parameter that informs the PS everywhere. For the PS, in, sorry, informs the background everywhere. For the PSF, there's all sorts of physical parameters for the PSF that really do apply to the whole visit, and you might want to constrain them from all the stars on the visit. Um, in reality, of course, this, I think, will be some sort of scatter-gather. We do a little processing on, on one CCD. We expand to all the visits. We go back to one CD, CCD. Now, there's also a simplification here. You can't do detection until you've done background estimation, but you also can't do background estimation until you know where all the objects are so you can mask them out. You can't do PSF modeling until you've done measurement, but you also can't do measurement until you've done PSF modeling. So we really need to iterate this. Now there's a good chance we'll just iterate this once. And the first iteration will just put a stupid background in and a really naive PSF model. And it won't really be a true iteration, but in the sense that we'd have to iterate multiple times until it seems like it's converged. But we do have to do all of this more than once, essentially. All right, moving on to image differencing. So this is what we do nightly to find the, um, the moving and transient objects. We start out up here with a template image. This is a coad that came from some other previous processing and it covers the whole sky. We cut out the chunk of what we want. We also have the exposure we just calibrated from visit processing. And we do all of this one CCD at a time. We warp this to match this one. So we're warping the coad, not the new image we just got. That's because the coad already has higher signal noise and it makes more sense to warp the thing that has higher signal noise. We warp that. We also match them to have the same PSFs. Um, that means you have to compute what kernel maps this PSF to another PSF as a function of position. And that's a very tricky business. Warp means essentially re interpolate and resample onto a different coordinate system. Um, we've got, got a PSF matched warp template image, and we subtract them. And this gives us a difference image in which only the things that move or change their flux or are brand new for the first time are in that image. We detect those, we measure those. At this point, we're probably not worried about deblending them because there's going to be so few of them. Um, but you could imagine throwing a deblending step in here. Um, this gives us different sources. And we also have this thing called MOPS, which associates different, different sources the, into, especially the trailed ones, into solar system objects. So this is as we return back to the same part of the sky um, in a relatively short amount of time, the asteroids move from here to here. And we say, oh, these two things are actually the same object. One is a template image, which is a coad that was produced some time before um, that covers the same patch of sky, and it's the new exposure we just got. So this was, you can imagine this being produced in the previous data release. So, so, so every night, when you go to some yes, and the question of how we bootstrap to get the first one of these is a difficult one. We don't really know how we're going to do that. Yes. Yeah, so what you what you'd like to do is have a very small PSF here. So this one only has to grow to be matched to this one. Um, that's impossible in practice. But there are also tricks you can do where you might. This is going a little bit beyond the depth I wanted to. But there are games you can play where you actually don't convolve 
this to match this, you convolve this to match this convolve with something else that you know, um, and that helps you out later on the line because then you can only grow things. You're right, you, when you do this matching, you can maybe do it, get away with a little bit of deconvolution, but you really want to do net, net convolution, not deconvolution. All right, self-calibration, this is a really simple cartoon of what self-calibration means. So you can imagine um, we have the measured source positions of everything in lots and lots of different exposures. Um, we have a parameter, we have a model with a bunch of parameters for what the distortions of the, of the focal plane and the CCDs and the, the, the photometric zero points and the throughput at every pixel. And there's a bunch of models and there's a bunch of parameters in that model. Plus, we also have parameters that say what are the true positions and fluxes of all these things. Then we make a big matrix that says what are the predicted source positions and fluxes given the model parameters. And then we solve this giant matrix. So as you can imagine, this is a really giant matrix because this is all of the sources we've ever detected. Um, over some large bit of sky. You want this to be larger than a visit so you can calibrate multiple visits together. Um, and then this is a lot of parameters because there's some of the, some of the uh, parameters are like things for the chips. You don't expect to change very often. Some of them do change all the time because they're, they're dependent on, on the uh, atmosphere. And then, there, of course, there's also parameters for the true positions of all the actual objects. Keeping, oh, yes. Um, not quite. I, I mean, it is actually, this is just one step in a nonlinear iteration. Um, but I think you, you do get close enough to um, the, the, the correct positions in the, in the rough um, calibrations we do um, in the visit processing that it's probably not too many steps. And it's certainly true that the hard part of this problem is finding a, a way to solve this matrix subproblem that's just one iteration of the, the nonlinear problem. So deep processing, I'm going to be even more vague here, even though this is to me the most interesting stuff, because we don't really know how we're going to do a lot of this. I mean, we have lots of ideas on how we're going to do that, but we have to test a lot of them, and we haven't really settled which ones we like best. So first off, we're going to improve the background models, um, and we're going to do this by demanding consistency between epochs. So if you can imagine if you have two different exposures, they both have a different sky background in them, but they have the same objects. So for instance, when we did, when we did that difference imaging, if we did that between two exposures rather than between a template and an exposure, um, you would get all that was left in addition to the transients was the difference between the sky backgrounds between exposures. So in fact, you can do a much better job if you have n epochs by modeling the backgrounds of n minus one differences, adding all of those together, and then modeling one more um, full background. Um, so this is called background matching. It's been done with SDSS. We've tried it a little bit with um, uh, uh, um, the LSST pipeline using uh, Hyper Supreme Cam data. I mean, it turns out it's much harder when you don't have a drift scan camera. Um, so that's something else we'll have to work on. Um, we're going to detect sources at full depth. How do you actually detect sources at full depth? Um, this is actually the exercise we'll work on next. Um, you'll probably use some sort of coads, but what kinds of coads is an open question. Um, maybe less of an open question for detection, but there's lots of options. Now we need to associate all of these deep sources with all the things we found other ways. We found, um, for instance, first off, we've, we've found multiple kinds of deep sources. Maybe we found deep sources in the R band, and maybe we also need to find deep sources in the Y band, and deep sources in the G band. Um, deep sources from a coed that only includes one year, so we can find objects that may have moved uh, more than that um, over the, the course of the survey. Um, and certainly all the things we found in, in image differencing. So if you find a supernova, it's going to get washed out from the coad, and this is not the way to detect a supernova. But when you want to model everything together, you might want to include the supernova because it's still affecting all the measurements of the things it sits on top of, which includes at least a galaxy. Um, so we've associated them all together. We have one consistent set of sources over the whole sky, and now we need to blend them. We need to find some way to be able to measure them um, measure the, the properties of individual objects even though they're overlapping. Um, and this is tricky, and you can imagine doing it by fitting multiple models simultaneously, or you can imagine doing it by trying to split up the flux in every pixel in a way that kind of at least makes sense a little bit. Um, then we, of course, need to measure stuff. Um, we're planning to start that on coads, but we'll go back to all the individual exposures, because it turns out you can't get all the information you need out of a single coad, and that's a point we'll return to later. 
Any other questions on the very, very vague view of deep processing? Uh, this is just a term I came up with myself, right, recently. I mean, it, because it's, it's processing all the deepest objects. It's everything else we, we hit at some other point, but this is the only chance we get to do the deepest, ob the faintest objects. You could just as well call it faint object processing. At some level, it will be objects with sub-objects in the sense that we, also, we want to, you know, measure under the hypothesis this was actually one thing and measure under the hypothesis that this was actually multiple things. It's not clear how many levels of that there will be. Certainly, as you add more, you end up measuring the same pixels multiple times, and that gets expensive to do. But there, I think there's going to be at least two levels. Um, SDSS did that, and I think we have a general rule of thumb that we can't do worse than SDSS at anything. <laughs> Um. Yes. I think of uh, it, that probably reflects the fact that I'm not an expert at that. Um, my assumption is sort of that this is those are going to enter in as, a, as additional data vectors here um, and additional, uh, you know, predictions with the form of the model parameters on those. Some of them will probably come in as, as inputs to the ISR as well, but those are, I think, a different sort of calibration product. Um, all right. So um, let's start off with this very simple problem. We want to find all the point sources in an image which has known Gaussian noise, so we know the, the, the noise properties of the image at every pixel, and it has a known PSF above a certain significance. Now, first we have to figure out what significance actually means. But I'm going to start um, with a nice log likelihood. So this is a Gaussian. That means it has a log likelihood that looks like this. This is our image data. There's pixel ind indices right there. Um, the source position is XY. So we're saying, what's the likelihood of having a source at this position, in this image data, with this flux, alpha, with this PSF model, and that noise. All right, does this make sense? It's, it's just regular least squares um, for the point source being the model of the object and this flux. Um, yes. Well, you could also say you can put it either way. You can say that we've measured that, the, that this is, I will, I'm assuming that this is, we have enough counts that we're, we can assume Poisson noise equals Gaussian noise. I think since I haven't specified that this is, uh, is constant, then it could also still be a, a, a bright object. All right, so we start with this, um, but let's just expand that out. Um, so I've, writ, I've taken alpha out in the front, and I've got the term here that involves the PSF model squared, and I've got the term here that involves the PSF model um, correlated with the image, and I've ignored the term that just involves the image out here because it doesn't depend on our model parameters. So does that make sense? Yes, yeah. I mean, assuming, assuming it's Gaussian noise, this is the likelihood function. Um, for a single point source in one image. I, yeah, I, I, I are the pixel indices. All right, so now we can do the usual thing to find the maximum likelihood flux. We differentiate by alpha, set that to zero, and say the maximum likelihood flux is just this thing over this thing. What? Yes. Uh, no, again, that the... the the sig, well, okay, I'm saying that sigma is measured from the data, but that would also be, an, I think either one is sort of an appropriate way to do it, and it's a, a question of the sort of things of n's versus n minus ones in denominators as to which one of us is formally correct. But we, we can talk about that later. You're probably right in, in terms of being formally correct. But, and then again, this mostly deals with faint objects anyhow, um, because bright things are easy to detect. Um, so anyhow, we can plug this in 
up here and say that the likelihood at the maximum likelihood point, or the log likelihood, is this thing squared over to this thing. Yes. Yeah, sorry, the I, I, the I sub IJ is background subtracted. I'm making lots of simplifications here, but this is, most of them are actually not that far wrong. Um, I'm, I'm not even considering better, better at this point. This is true. Yeah, assuming, assuming we've gotten the PSF model corrected for brighter fatter somehow, yes. Um, uh, to be honest, on brighter fatter, I'm actually hoping that we can, in the end, take care of that at the ISR stage, and then I can deal with pristine, unobstructed pixel data later. That may not turn out to be the case. Um, okay, so we've got this maximum likelihood. I forgot the K before, but there is a K there. Um, the log likelihood for zero flux is just k, because there's the alpha terms are zero. And we can form an, a likelihood ratio for what for the chance that there is an object here with the maximum likelihood flux, and there is nothing here. And that likelihood ratio is this. Now, this, of course, looks like a Gaussian. And so this is our significance. It's just the square root of this thing. And so when someone says, we did, we're, this is the five sigma point source detection limit, this is the significance they're actually talking about. Now, um, there's a lot of assumptions that went into that, um, and maybe some dubious statistics if you're a, a, a Bayesian purist, but um, this is the definition that, that has become the standard one. And the point I want to make here is that this thing that was in the numerator is just a correlation of the image with the PSF, and the thing in the, in the denominator depends only on the PSF model and the noise. It doesn't actually depend on the image data. So here's our algorithm for detecting point sources in a single epoch. We correlate the image with the PSF to get this thing. We either evaluate that thing that depended on the PSF model as an image, or we, we pretend it's constant, which is not a terrible approximation for this purpose, at least. And we find regions where that significance is greater than the threshold. So if this number is greater than five, we say it's detected if we want a five sigma threshold. And we call those regions of above threshold pixels footprints. And within each footprint, we find peaks. Now, you'll notice there's nothing here about requiring a certain number of connected pixels. That's something that Source Extractor added that many astronomers are familiar with. It's actually not um, uh, statistically motivated. Um, it might work well. There's lots of things that aren't statistically motivated that work well, um, but it's not the way we're planning to approach this. Now, this just tells you these footprints just include, you know, significant peaks. Um, you would probably want to grow them by something like the size of the PSF to get some indication of the size of the object. And then all this is, again, just assuming point sources. Now, what do we want to do if we want to detect things in multiple epochs? And these multiple epochs don't have the same PSF model, but we can assume we know about their noise and we know about their PSFs. What do we want to do? If we, we, we want to detect objects that are not moving, not varying, um, using all the image data optimally. Uh, right, but they have a different PSF. So maybe B, what do you mean by signal to no, a signal noise map? How would you construct a signal noise map? Okay, right. I think it's actually you want to warp, uh, you want to create a code out of this and create a code of this and then, um, at least when I worked it out, this is what I did. I haven't worked out your way to figure out whether they're equivalent or not. They might be, um, or under certain, but anyhow, yes, you don't co-add the pixels. You co-add this thing that you correlated the pixels by the PSF, and then you co-add this thing that depends on the PSF, and then you, you form this. Now, this is different from what most of us do when we make co-ads. Most of us co-add the pixels, which, is, which makes sense. That's what a telescope does when you take a long exposure. But it turns out that's not the optimal way to use the data you have. And this is, at least for detection. Well, it, it would be if you had a model for the thing and you, wanted, and you were willing to iterate over all the exposures together. This is... Uh, 
Yes, okay. So I guess my point is, for, if we're doing multi-epic shape fitting, for instance, um, that's, we essentially have to do that. We could do that here, but we actually don't have to. This is just as optimal as doing that, making this coad. There is no coad that does this for measurement purposes, at least not that I know of, but there is a coad that does this for detection purposes. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yep. So you can think of this. You're, you're, you're using the optimal filter right here. You can't just co-add and then do an optimal filter later because you've already it's a different, there's a different optimal filter for every image. Yes, These, this turns out actually is, or proportional to a likelihood image. Um, all right, so now we're going to take extensions and go further. I don't, this was a case where there's this sort of a closed form optimal solution giving not too unreasonable position, uh, assumptions. These are all situations where there is no such thing. And I'm going to try to divide the room up into four bits, and each of you is going to get responsible. I mean, you'll have to turn around people in the front rows and shout to your neighbors in the back and figure out which, and, and, and come up with some sort of idea for how to extend this algorithm to one of these cases. So people, let's see, right here, if you're before the bend in this table, you're responsible for point sources where you have multiple epics, which we just did, but you also have multiple bands and you don't know the SED of the object. Maybe you have some idea of what star SEDs are, but you don't know exactly what SED you're looking for. People here to here, um, you are dealing galaxies, you have multiple epics, and you only have a single band, but you don't know what the morphology of your galaxy is. Uh, let's see, oh wait, where is the center of this room? This is the center of the room. Sorry, people over here, you're doing galaxies. People. How about if you do that half and that half, and put it together, and it's like yeah, cores. Yeah, cores, okay, that works. Okay, let's try this again. Uh, first two rows, this half of the room, stars with unknown SEDs. Back half, this half of the room, galaxies. Uh, front half of the room, on this side, you, you, ooh, I'm echoing. Um, you're doing faint, high proper motion stars with multiple epics. So these are things that are moving, and they're moving more than, the, they're moving approximately the size of the PSF between epics, say. Uh, people in the back half, you're doing supernovae and you've got multiple epics and multiple bands, and you know they're SED, um, but we're trying to find things that we can't find in just one epic. Um, so those of you in the front bits of those rows are going to have to turn around and talk to people in the back bits of those rows. Um, you'll have a fair bit of time to talk about this, uh, and I'll, I will ask representatives or, or you know, all of you chatting at once to tell me what you've come up with in a few minutes. Sorry, can you give us the remote um, so, given the, the, the kind of algorithm we had before, what kinds of things would you try, you know, what combinations of images would you want to look at? Do you want to try to do this on a grid of images with different, you know, weights of SEDs maybe, or, or can you come up with a way to do this in a continual way, in a continuous way that doesn't involve a, a grid of SEDs? <laughs>
Finalize your arguments. Be prepared to present them. All right. So we're going to start in. Oh, this is loud. Let's let's start this off in somewhat reverse order. We're going to have the two um, supernova teams go first back here. Um, so, uh, Team Supernova on the further side here. Do you guys want to tell us what kinds of ideas you came up with? Oh, go ahead. Okay. All right. Um, I will not comment on that until after the other supernova people have, have talked about what ideas they came up with. So similar, similar ideas there. I think uh, sort of taking the, the approach that we don't know exactly what the properties of this thing are, so we can't design one match filter, but we can imagine sort of a bunch of them and, and trying a bunch of them together and, and, uh, and sort of in a grid approach. Um, let's, sure. So for the record, um, in data management, we don't have any plan for detecting supernova beyond below the single epic limit. Um, if you did want to, I can imagine we'd do something similar along those lines where you'd sort of, you know, add up things for maybe a month and look in the month's co-add um, because the supernova maybe is, you know, it's bright for about a month. And if you had a rolling window of a month, maybe you'd find more than if you looked at, just looked at a, a single epic. On the other hand, I'm not sure there's actually any scientific, much of a scientific application for that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, not all of them are unmotivated. That one, I, that one, I mean, I'm not a supernova person, so I, I don't know how unmotivated it is, but I just came up with it on top of my head. All right, um, let's see. We also had two groups doing galaxies. Um, let's hear from this galaxy group first in the middle.
Yeah, yeah. So uh, you, you can do that. You just don't pick up quite as much as you would if you were to use a slightly different filter that was slightly broader, for instance. It, it ends up being a different definition of your, I mean, of your detection threshold for galaxies, and it could be a perfectly valid one. But then someone will come in and say, why didn't you find my low surface brightness galaxy? No, no, it wasn't intended to be that way. Um, if you have something interesting to do. <laughs> All right, galaxy group number two over here. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, when we were talking a little bit before, you also had an interesting idea about how to make that, how to, to go from that which is not optimal for five sigma point sources to a way, a way that does detect things that, or sorry, a way that is not optimal for five sigma galaxies, if you were to know the galaxy, you know, filter exactly. But you could make it work, make it find all the five sigma galaxies. Do you remember which thing I'm talking about or should I just quit being cryptic here? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, well, so the, the idea I heard them mention earlier, um, well, no, I'll, I'll save that till later in case someone else comes with it. All right, let's do, um, let's do point sources with unknown SED. Do we have a spokesperson from this group over here? All right. Yes. So one, one of the ideas you had there was that um, you can use the colors you already have. Now, the problem with detection is you don't have the colors yet. But that, that is an idea you can use, and we'll get back to that in a moment. Um, uh, 
The other thing that you mentioned was that you could use pairs of, of, I assume, adjacent filters. Now, you could also do far apart ones. But if you do adjacent filters, that you're using an assumption about what the, the SED is. But it's, a, I think, a reasonable one that it's not going to be a sharply varying assumption that, you know, the thing appears in, in G, disappears from R, and then appears back again in I. It's more likely you'll have R and I together than, than missing a chunk in the middle. Yes, that can break down. Certainly in the other direction, yeah, emission and, and uh, um, absorption lines. Well, that would certainly complicate matters. I, I think they're, you know, yes. Right, right. So you, ha you have, you can say something about, is this a reasonable SED for a, an object that I understand, but it, you can't say something like, here's the space of all possible SEDs. All right, moving point sources, or high proper motion stars. Uh, by all means. Yeah. They're both equally scribbled on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yep. All right. So I, I think the advantage of the, the real case world analog of this is that well as you said, it's, it's probably computationally infeasible to find things that are moving that fast um, that are also this faint. And the, but you can imagine things that, that move some fraction of the PSF size and being able to, to not have to try too much in, order, in terms of dithering or, or, or even just you know, stacking them together in small regions of time and hoping that they, they still add coherently. Um, again, these are all problems where I don't think there are, there are known solutions. I mean, I mean, let's just assume that this is computationally feasible. Okay. Yes, but, but the, I think the advantage of this is that you actually know how many you're getting. You're getting however many you get if it's the edge of the five sigma tail. Because I, it, for each of these, we're doing this with some optimal filter. And if we're finding things that, that are not real, using that optimal filter, we, I think we have a good sense for there, there are noise fluctuations, but they're the, they're the number we expect. And if we want less, we have to go to six sigma. For just sort of one one PSF or order shifts. Okay. Tractable.
Well, they, they won't have been detected as transients yet. So you need to do something at the image level before you get them to call them transients. You'd have to add them at the image level, I think. And then you could, yeah, I think we get the same. That, that, that I think was what Andy was talking about with difference images. Um, so what, one thing I, I wanted to bring up here, another option is if you want to detect at five sigma for something you don't know what its filter is, but you know, you've got it kind of close, you can also detect at four sigma, four and a half sigma and then reject the things that are at five sigma, or re reject the things that aren't at five sigma once you've come up with what your, your reasonable um, filter is. And I, I think in the end, we'll probably end up having to do some combination of these sort of grid-based things that we've talked about where we have to explore a fairly high dimensional or you know, a, a large number of parameters um, for what we combine and how many optimal filters we have in this set with a, with a situation where we, we lower our thresholds a little bit and then cull things later. You clearly don't want to, to lower your thresholds too much because then uh, you get a lot of noise things and you end up spending a lot of time evaluating the, the, whether this noise thing is real when you apply the correct filter. Um, but that's also how you can use a lot of the ideas that you guys came up with um, where you don't, um, you know, you'd like to use the colors, for instance, to come up with a, a guess at what the, the SED is and you don't have the colors yet, but you can put the S, you can, you know, do four and a half sigma detections, measure colors from that and see if you get a reasonable SED. Um, one of the problems I, I, as a lensing person, the ones I worry about the most is the one that this group brought up over here, is that any optimal filter you can imagine for galaxies is going to bias you. Um, and that's going to be true whether you do it initially to detect the things or afterwards as a way to cull out the things that really aren't five sigma. Um, and I don't know how to solve that problem. Probably doing simulations and calibrating it out somehow that way, but it's a hard one. And my guess is there are other similar ones for other, um, other types of objects that I'm just not as aware of. Okay, this is my last slide. Um, and I was just going to be um, talking about the kinds of co-ads we've dealt with a little bit here so far. So why didn't we just co-add the pixels instead of co-adding this um, psi thing? Um, the PSF is different between images and we want to co-add likelihoods, not co-add pixels. Now, why don't we always do that? Why can't we just co-add those things and do all of our measurements on those things? <laughs> well, I think the simple answer is maybe that we haven't thought hard enough about it. Normally, we're used to doing modeling in the, in the sense where, you know, we're looking at the data, we forward model everything through the data, and, you know, we, we come up with our own likelihood function for some other model with the galaxy, say it has a bunch of different parameters for galaxies, and we can involve it by the PSF model and we compare it to the data. This thing isn't that kind of data anymore. Th those kinds of algorithms don't work. Um, so part of it is just that we haven't done that thought experiment. Um, I'm also worried that when we do the thought experiment, we'll actually find out it doesn't work. And one of the reasons I could guess being that we've correlated a whole bunch of noise when we've convolved by these, uh, when we've correlated by the PSF model. And so the noise properties of that likelihood image are a lot harder to, to disentangle than it would be for a normal pixel image. It does, it does, and yes. Now, if it's just the, the point source model likelihood, then you can imagine easy ways to go from that to the likelihood for some other thing. You know, because the, the, the convolutions are linear, you can convolve that by your galaxy, and now it's a likelihood for a galaxy at that position. Um, but I still don't really know how to use that to do to do measurements, and I and I I suspect that that you you can't do it. To, you, there are some kinds of measurements you can't do on that image. Um, or they just get so hard that they're computationally infeasible because of the noise cor correlations. Um, and since I don't have time to go over this in detail, what other kinds of co-ads we might want to create? Um, think about this. Another one that you certainly have heard something about is PSF matched co-ads. Um, and so it's worth thinking about why we might want to sometimes do that. Clearly those destroy data. You're making your, your best seeing data have the same PSF as your worst seeing data. But people do do it sometimes. And, the reason that I think we might have to do it is to measure the colors of galaxies when we don't know the morphology um, and we don't know the PSF model exactly. So that's an exercise to you guys. Think about why PSF matched coeds might save you from that and think about how you might avoid having PSF matched coeds for that. Michael. Mm-hmm. Mm 
Yeah, I, which of these are online algorithms and which aren't? Which one are not? I think is the, the technical term for that. I think for the most part, it usually involves you just have to save some extra data, and then you can make any of these an online algorithm. And, and usually, the extra data you have to save isn't too onerous, unless you're trying to store all of the covariance matrices for all the pixels, which is too onerous to begin with. All right, here's the page with more information. You can also find this from the DE School Wiki page, um, and that's about it. Thanks.